all good things come to an end. And uh, the only thing that I know that is a really good thing that doesn't come to an end is Yao, the uh, creator of the universe, the author of life, the father of the covenant family, uh, and all things that he has conceived relative to his family um, are eternal, but uh, not to this show. This is our last Shattering Myth show. We've done it for a better part of four years, and part of that uh, invested four years on Blog Talk Radio. The Friday evening show, for those who listen, uh, airing at 7.30 on Friday evenings, it will continue uh, on Blog Talk Radio, Yada Yada Radio. And uh, That's the better show anyways. <laughs> thank you. And we will, um, in about a month's time, um, we're going to prepare uh, four one-hour shows, mostly focused on the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, that uh, Scott, uh, Kirk, Larry, and I are going to uh, record. And uh, we're going to uh, uh, post the archives. Actually, Richard has volunteered to post the archives. We're... Most of you listen to this program, uh, the archives at um, blessyawa.com. And we will continue to, um, to translate and continue to study and share um, what we learn in the Torah and the Prophets. And that's what the, that's what the new one will be mostly about. Yes. Uh, we're not going to do the new one. Rather than the problem. There yeah, you go. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, the hope is that uh, many of the things that are being discovered, um, that the Proverbs 6 was the first of them. It's going to be the opening chapter in a, a new book uh, called Prophetic Observations. And as passages are translated and incorporated into these uh, collections of prophetic observations from Yahweh's testimony, they'll become the basis of those programs and the basis of the, of the additional book. Kirk, um, I know you wanted to share your thoughts on something that um, we just um, sort of uh, stumbled upon. I'm, I'm not going to take any credit for this. We, we were studying Yahweh's testimony in Proverbs 6, and we came to the realization that Yahweh said, the Torah is light. And the implications of the Torah being light, for example, that means that the set-apart spirit which is the manifestation of Yahweh's light in our world, uh, is the Torah. And that means that the Torah uh, is revealed and explained, um, and uh, we are counseled in our study of the Torah by the set apart spirit because there are zero degrees of separation between them. It also means that the Torah is absolutely indestructible, and the Torah is eternal because the Torah is light. It also means, since Yahweh said that he is light, that the Torah is Yahweh, and Yahweh is the Torah, and it means that Yosha was nothing more and nothing less than a material embodiment of the Torah, which is why he fulfilled it, why he lived it, why he said that, that so long as the heavens and earth exist, not a single letter or even stroke of the Hebrew letters that comprise the Torah will ever go away. Now, for those of you, before I hear Kirk's uh, comments on uh, the Torah being light, for those of you who are distraught by hearing that because you've been given this broadcast uh, by a covenant friend, uh, someone uh, who knows Yahweh, understands the Torah and the covenant, but you yourself do not, and you have been beguiled into thinking, to believing, that the Torah is a set of antiquated laws that no one could possibly um, uphold, and that, that God is a cosmic killjoy and wants you to obey these ancient laws. The good news is, Torah does not mean law. Torah is a, a very clearly communicated term. Yahweh defines it in his first use of it. It's based on the verb yara. It means source from which guidance, teaching, direction, and instruction flows. So while I chafe at laws, I love guidance and teaching and direction, particularly when they come from the individual responsible for creating the universe and for authoring life. Second, there is no Hebrew word for obey. The term that Yahweh 
uses in conjunction with his Torah, shamar, means to use your eyes to closely examine and carefully consider. It is to observe. And he also asks us to shama, which is to listen to his Torah, his guidance, his teaching. And then we're in a position where we can make an informed decision whether or not we like the author of these instructions, whether we are fond of the guidance that he is providing, whether we as individuals think that we would benefit from spending eternity with him. And if we do, then the next thing we ought to consider are the five terms and conditions that enable us to be part of his covenant family and to receive the benefits of the covenant. So with those things said, uh, Kirk, what are your thoughts on uh, the Torah being light and what that means to us? Well, I, I you know, we extrapolated the other day that uh, if Yahweh is light, then mm -hmm. uh, the Royal Kodesh is light because a part of infinity is still infinity. So mm -hmm. Yosha, therefore, a diminished part would still be uh, the same as Yahweh, so he'd be light. He was the light unto the earth. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. he came in the 4,000 year when light appears and... Yeah, he showed, by the way, he showed himself uh, to uh, Jacob, Shimon, and uh, Yehokanan in his more uh, natural form, which was as light, light the Mount of Transfiguration. He showed himself as light. When he returns, how does he say he's going to come back? He's going to come back to wretched it up light even more. Yeah, probably. brilliant, uh, brilliant light. So Yahweh equals light. Right, and then if you said he's the Word, and that makes, and the Word means the Torah, mm -hmm. both Torah, uh, then the Torah would be light too. So you can kind of prove it that way without uh, much argument at all. And you may have already come to this conclusion. You may have even said that I was uh, been uh, <clears throat> yesterday was not a good day for me, so my brain was kind of disengaged. I'm sorry. But last night I went back and I said, okay, I remember doing a study on the Torah, on every word, to Torah, tur, mm -hmm. to tob, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and mm -hmm. pulled that out of my drawer. Mm -hmm. And I said, if he's light, if the Torah is light, then it should say so in one of these definitions. And I went through all these definitions, and quite frankly, it didn't say light. And I said, well, that's very odd. Why would it not say that? Yeah, because I missed it. Well, I I looked at, so I just decided, well, I... I you know why I missed it? Why well, I missed let me, it? Let me, okay. let me see what I concluded, then, then you're talking okay. about it. Okay, all right. So I'm sitting here looking at uh, the four letters in, in uh, ancient Hebrew. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the word Torah, the way we spell it phonetically, mm -hmm. and I'm just staring at it. T-O-W-R-A-H, because it's, it's written T-I-W-R-H uh, in Hebrew, and the, the, um, uh, both the W and the H are vowels, and so it is pronounced Torah. But if you want to include the Hebrew letters that lead to that pronunciation as they're written in the text, it's T. R or T O R H. Mm -hmm. T -W I'm sorry, I keep on saying that. No, right. It's T T yeah uh, T O W. So it's T W R H. That's Torah. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking. So I looked up light, and I and I looked up all the words for light, and I'm sitting here still thinking. Yeah. What is the primary word for what is the primary word for light? What word did Yahweh use in Proverbs six for light? Or or. Yeah, O W R, or right? Or is the way we spell it and pronounce it. And what are uh, the uh, what are the three middle letters in um, uh, in Torah? Well, that that was my conclusion. I'm staring here, and all of a sudden I'm saying, no. "Well, gosh, light is right in the middle of the word Torah." You stupid yeah. idiot. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I didn't uh, see it is that uh, in my study, um, I only looked at Hebrew words that had the uh, one of the two T's, because the two T's were, were at one time one, they became two, and you, what you can find is that if you study the two T's in Hebrew, um, that that um, uh, there are many words which uh, are, are pronounced and defined identically with one uh, of the, uh, of the uh, T's or the other. Um, so the, I included every word that had the, uh, the T in it, Followed by the uh, the wa and the ra, and I and I did not, because I was trying to be very focused on the definition. The only thing that I considered beyond the t, the o, and the r in combination with uh, each other 
and including all three of those was the uh, uh, derivatives of the Hebrew verb that Yahweh told us formed the basis of Torah, which is Yara, the verb that means uh -huh, the source from which guidance, teaching, uh, instruction uh, uh, flows. Uh, so since he defined it using that verb, I felt that, okay, I could, I could also define it using that verb uh -huh. uh, and be on solid ground. And then as I was doing this, I had, I had, I was translating Torah out of a passage that uh, said that the Torah was Tob. And Tob has, uh, has uh, you know, three of the four letters. It just adds one additional letter at the end, the Be'eth, the family. Uh, and so it, it really means the family is, uh, is enriched and the family is, uh, is good. So, um, a hundred percent of that definition, and I'd like you to share it with, uh, since you've got it uh, handy here with our listeners. But uh, I did not venture outside of those very tight confines because I wanted to present a definition of Torah that was absolutely indisputable. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, yes. since Yahweh says Torah or Torah is light. Right. Then, to uh, to uh, to recognize that O W R mm -hmm. is the heart of Torah. Yeah. Something so simple, and, and all of a sudden it takes so long to go. Wow, catch it yeah. right there before you ask. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the moment um, you said that you were considering this yesterday, um, it. Uh, it Slap me right between the uh, the eyes. Uh, of course, you know O W R is the Hebrew word for light. When Yahweh says that He is light, that He created light, and Barashith one introduces Himself as light, it's O W R, mm. and Or is the uh, the heart of uh, sure. of Tor. And so, uh, yes, indeed, you um, you are correct. Uh, Yahweh created uh, Torah out of His light. It represents his light. And while we can say that there are two manifestations of Yahweh in our world, in effect, those two manifestations of Yahweh are one, and they are equivalent to Yahweh himself. It was so simple, really. But the implications of the Torah being light is um, profound. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that while light can be set apart from a source, so that defined by the set apart spirit, she is light set apart from Yahweh. Um, light is uh, spirit undiminished. Now, the, when, you, when I say, for example, Yahweh equals light, Torah equals light, uh, Yahweh equals set apart spirit, um, and therefore, because Torah equals light, Torah set apart spirit, Yahweh, and light are all synonymous. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to, to convey the idea that they are equivalent. No. Um, light is, is an undiminished representation of, uh, you know, if it came from a star, for example, the light that enters your eye from, uh, eye from a star might be one billionth, trillionth, quadrillionth of the light from that star. But the, that light that you see from the star is undiminished. It's in its undiminished form, even though it does not represent the totality of the star. The same thing is true with the set-apart spirit. The set-apart spirit is Yahweh undiminished. It represents Yahweh. It, it is Yahweh. The set of our spirit is Yahweh. It's an undiminished representation of Yahweh. But the set of our spirit does not represent the totality of Yahweh. Now, it might sound like that's contradictory. No. But it's not. It's the, you know, the, the photon of light that was generated in that star that, uh, that we perceive represents the same light that is in the star. It's an undiminished representation of the light of that star. Uh, but that light is not the totality of the light of that star. And so Yahweh 
is much greater than his Torah. And yet his Torah represents an undiminished manifestation or representation of him. The set of her spirit does not represent the totality of Yahweh, but she came from Yahweh and she is undiminished from Yahweh. She is Yahweh in his uh, uh, most um, Accessible? Uh, yeah, acce well, it's not only accessible form, but Yahweh in, the, in his most natural state. Okay. She is Yahweh as spirit. She is Yahweh as energy. Um, so she is Yahweh in his natural state as spirit, as energy, as light. She is all of those things. So she is not a representative of Yahweh as is Yosha, uh, diminished into matter. Uh, she is Yahweh in his natural state, exactly as Yahweh is, spirit, light, energy. She is just not the totality of Yahweh, which is what the concept set apart conveys. Mm -hmm. The Torah, likewise, is a natural representation of Yahweh. If you think of the Torah as simply... Um, a book that you can pick up and read, and it is that book that you're lugging around, and, and that book uh, that book is a physical thing. Mm -hmm. If you Shemar Torah, observe it. If you Shema Torah, listen to it. And then you do what Proverbs 6 said. You take what you observe, you take what you learn, you take what you've come to understand, and you put it into your heart. You make it part of the fabric of your life. It forms your motivations and your perspective and your understanding of the world. It incorporates you um, into the covenant family, and it makes you just like God. Because that, that part of God is now inside of you. Uh, so you have to, to appreciate the Torah being an undiminished enlightened representation of Yahweh. It's what the Torah represents, what it conveys, and its influence on us when we observe it and act upon it that is so transforming. It literally, when we incorporate it into our lives, transforms us into light. As, as um as you, I'm sitting here and you're saying that the absurdity of, of what this is and have, having someone like Paul say dismiss it is just yeah. so bizarre. In it, makes, it, it makes him the most deadly plague yeah. in all of human history. No one darker. Now, when we return, we're going to consider what light does and how, therefore, the Torah so it's been there all the time. The uh, Torah opens with the uh, creating uh, light, starting the universe with light, um, and defining himself as light. And then he defines the Torah as light. And all along he has defined the spirit as set apart. And the spirit is always modified by Kodesh, set apart. And therefore, it, since the spirit is set apart from Yahweh, the spirit is part of Yahweh, set apart from him. The spirit is light. Every metaphor describing the spirit presents the spirit as light. The set apart spirit is light. Spirit and light are equivalent concepts. And the Torah is light. Now, what happens if... Um, Evil is always equated with darkness. Most people, for example, when they're acting badly, they'll, uh, they'll put on a, a black ski mask, won't they, to hide their face. Mm -hmm. uh, evil likes to do its thing in, uh, in the darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, for the Muslims, they attacked at night mm -hmm. in Paris. Uh, it's just the nature of evil. Evil loves the, uh, the darkness. When you uh, walk into a pitch black room, everything is dark. And uh, you either open the, uh, the blinds to let outside light in, or you turn on the lights in that room. What happens to the darkness? It goes away. Yeah, and that's the answer. In the presence of light, 
darkness goes away. There is no darkness. Yahweh uses light to take away, to obliterate, to remove the imperfections in our soul. And by doing so, he's not covering over them. He's not reconciling them. He's not even forgiving them. Obliterating them, basically. Yeah, he doesn't even have to forget them. No. They cease to exist. When we're wrapped in the Torah, that which is crummy about us, that which is imperfect about us, that which is flawed and rebellious about us, ceases to exist. It is the way that Dode, who understood the Torah more than anyone, who admitted that he had more flaws than he had hair on his head, is called upright, right, righteous, Sadak, vindicated. Why? Because he was covered in, wrapped in the Torah. It was not just that he was wrapped in the Torah's garment of light by the set-apart spirit. It's that he incorporated the Torah. He brought the Torah into his very heart, into his very nature. Now, this says, and that is what transformed him. That's what made the flawed individual perfect. Didn't make him look perfect. Made him perfect. Absolutely, unequivocally perfect. It is how the Torah saves. And yesterday we talked with Larry about how we don't like the term salvation very much because it's such a de minimis aspect of, uh, right. of what we gain in the covenant. Well, how about this? Yahweh is not in the business of saving us. He's in the business of transforming us. And the moment we are transformed by his Torah and become light, there is no salvation. We simply represent, we become eternal. We become immortal. We become empowered. We become enriched by the very act of bringing the Torah into our fabric of our lives, the net result of bringing that light, Yahweh's light, into our lives and wrapping ourselves up with it. Uh, is that we are transformed into light, which makes us perfect because there is no darkness. It's all gone. It makes us immortal because light exists forever. It makes us empowered because light is, is the speed of light times the speed of light more energetic than is matter. It's the, it's the means to being enriched it's the means to being empowered. It's the means to becoming immortal. It's the means to being transformed into Yahweh's child as part of the covenant because we have to be just like him to be his children. Mm -hmm. All of that is a direct result of the realization that the Torah is Yahweh's light. But that's, how the, that's how the Torah saves. That's how the Torah enlightens. That's how the Torah uh, empowers, enriches, transforms. Go ahead, Kurt. No, I was just going to say, what better form would you want to be in? I mean, you can always diminish it to become, if you needed to walk in the creek and feel the water on your feet. That's, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but what better, come up with something that's better than that. I mean, my gosh, your, your brain is still totally running. Mm -hmm. Your inner being is still you. You're not a different character in the sense that you mm -mm. thought all that was you. That you're was an you. enlightened, empowered you. you you're you're an enriched, enlightened, eternal, and empowered you. You can travel in time and space. You can think clearer. Mm -hmm. you, and, and, and I mean, just magnified. You can magnified. Uh, navigate and explore all the seven dimensions. Yeah, plus, uh, you, you know, if. if we, we forget there's a macro universe if you just wouldn't do the universe by itself. You, you, uh, what do we use when, we, want, when we want to look at the when we want to look at the smallest thing? We use an electron huh? microscope. We use the, the 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 very smallest thing that we can use to uh, to illuminate it on our behalf. We will be smaller if we wish to be mm -hmm. than an electron. Yeah, we'll be able to explore the very fabric of the universe, because the fabric of the universe is the Torah. 
Light is the fabric of the universe, by the way. The universe is conceived by light. Matter is simply diminished and cooled, less energetic, by light. Uh, matter is organized light in a diminished form. And so being trans in transitioned into light, we become part of the fabric of, of who God is and what he created. And it explains how we then can move up and down through those dimensions. And all, of it, all of it makes sense. One of the definitions of light is order. Yes, order. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And light is the very thing that explains how Yao approves his existence. Now, so many people, Kurt, uh, are agnostic, saying they're not going to believe in a God that isn't knowable. That uh, unless God proves his existence, then it's, you know, it's religious faith. That's not true. Mm -hmm. The reason I wrote Yada Yada and focused on prophecy was to prove absolutely, unequivocally, that God not only exists, but that he presented us with a set of instructions that we can use that guide us to him. And he proved that he authored them and that he conceived the universe and life by filling his instructions with prophetic revelations. But when you understand that Yahweh is light and you understand the nature of light, then you realize while the Torah prophets and Psalms are filled with thousands of prophetic revelations, there's not a single prediction among them. No. And again, that's the beauty of light. One of the things, you know, Einstein, um, who happened to be a Yehudim, by the way, a Yisraelite. Yes. Einstein, uh, I, <laughs> I'm not going to claim that uh, Einstein was an inspired messenger of Yahweh, but Yahweh does use his chosen people to uh, provide his message to us. But with the case with Einstein, he didn't just reveal one aspect of light that is essential to our understanding, but two. One of those is the one we're talking about, which is E equals MC squared, that energy, light, is equivalent, equals I M, which is matter, times the speed of light squared. They are the exact same thing, they're just not the same amount of the same thing, like the set-apart spirit in Yahweh, like the Torah in Yahweh. Now, that is powerful because it tells us how we're being empowered and enriched by the Torah's light uh, and by the Torah's instructions on the covenant. Well, that's very powerful. It also tells us how Bukurim came to be with uh, Yosha becoming uh, manifest, and his ability to go from spiritual to, and therefore light, to physical, and back and forth between the two, as it served his, uh, his interest. Absolutely, it makes it clearer. Yeah. You can go back and forth between them, because that's what the E equals MC squares represents. So that explains so much about what God is offering us. That's why before Abraham understood what he was inheriting in the covenant, Yahweh had to take him to the spiritual realm and, and expose him to the light that was coming from stars. And he says, this is what you're inheriting. It's all there, right there before us. Yahweh explained it, but nothing helps you understand it or appreciate it more, I think, than the simple equation, E equals MC squared. It also explains who Yosha is as a diminished physical manifestation of Yahweh set apart from him. All of it makes sense. But there's a second formula that Einstein gave us. Do you know what that one is? Um, no, in splitting an atom or something? No, no, no. It's the one that explains why there's not a single prediction among the prophecies. It's that time oh. is relative. And time being relative uh, is a direct result of the recognition and that the experiment, the thought experiment that Einstein used uh -huh. to 
derive the fact that time was relative and that time moves at different speeds depending on one's proximity to, uh, to matter and enormous amounts of matter or energy or speed, velocity which is you know, created as a result of energy, is that he did a thought experiment on two beams of light. And the experiment was that if two beams of light are both traveling at 186,000 uh, miles per second at each other, what is the closing speed? And the closing speed is not twice 186,000 miles per second. The closing speed is 186,000 miles per second. It just um, doesn't diminish it. I mean, it doesn't change it. It just absorbs it. it becomes... Well, yeah, it's, a, it's that, that the... <clears throat> It's the realization that uh, that the, that uh, light represents the universal constant as it, as as we define time, and what Einstein then proved in a number of experiments that were conducted after his theory is that uh, light does in fact bend, and it does, and the time does in fact uh, slow in the presence of great speed, which light, of course, is the fastest thing in the universe. It's the universal constant in terms of speed. And that, that time on a photon of light simply slows all the way to the point that it simply exists. So it's not timeless. It means that on a photon of light, you would witness the past, the present, and the future simultaneously. It's all there before you. Yeah, yeah it's all there before you. And one of the interesting things, that you, you probably have a GPS that you've uh, used at one time or another. Um, I can pull one up on a computer. But okay. Yeah, no, no. All right. Uh, a, um, um, and I'll get GPSs on my phones and in my cars and all that sort of thing, my airplane, filled with GPSs. Do you know that the GPSs, because they're in satellites which are traveling at great speed to maintain their orbit above the Earth, have to be corrected for the difference in the rate that time moves on those satellites versus the rate that time moves on the Earth. And they're all based on, on timing, and that's how, that's how the GPS works. That if they don't make the relative adjustment based on relativity to the speed of the, uh, the satellites versus the speed of the Earth, that those satellites will give vastly erroneous uh, evaluations of where you are, which degrade over time. Yeah. So relativity is a fact. It's, it's, we call it the theory of relativity, but it's a fact. Now, what that means for, uh, for us is, is two things. One is when we're in eternity, because time simply exists, we will be able to maneuver in time. We will be able to explore the past and the future. We will be able to explore the vast uh, um, expanse of the universe, which from our perspective appears to go out 15 billion light years in all directions, which means even, even if on the remote chance that we actually know where the edge of it is, it would be 30 billion light years across, assuming that we know where the edge is. Uh, it could be more than that. But rather than taking 30 billion years to get from one side to the other, speed, which is distance over time, becomes an irrelevant concept when time simply is. So there is no constraint on speed other than the speed of light, but what do you care if time no longer flows? Yeah, I mean, you're not going to be late. No, you can be at one side of the universe to the other in zero time because time simply exists on the photon of light. So it gives you the opportunity to explore forever. It also makes you eternal because time simply exists eternally. How does that relate to prophecy? And why does that mean that a prophecy is not a prediction? There's a reason that Yahweh never gets any prophecy wrong. It, there's a reason that he can fill his prophecies with a explicit detail. Right. There is a reason that, that because even though God has presented us with a prophecy of something that is going to occur in our future, that we are not predestined to uh, to do those things. And all of that ex is explained. The lack of predestination, 
the lack of predicting, the specificity that is uh, associated with these prophecies, the fact that they're all 100% correct, is all explained in the relative nature of light. Mm -hmm. Because he's seen it. He's reporting. Yes. He has seen in our past our future. And so prophecy is future history. Right. He is reporting what he has witnessed in our future, in our past, and has recorded it in writing so that two things, I think I would come to go to three things, are the result. The first of those things is that since only a, a spiritual entity that is trustworthy and cares for us uh, can know with great precision our future in our past. The fact that there are thousands of these prophecies, all of which are exactly accurate, none of which has ever been wrong, proves conclusively that Yahweh exists, that he is God, that he exists out of the ordinary flow of time, that he exists in a dimension that exceeds our grasp, and that by sharing these with us, he cares. that he cares, and that he wants to be known. Yes. The second thing that prophecy uh, uh, does for us is it equips us, it prepares us. It's a, a bit of guidance as to what we should be um, aware of. I know what's going to happen to the United States. I know what's going to happen in Syria. I know what's going to happen with Israel. I know what's going to happen to the world over these next 18 years. And I know what's going to happen after that. Mm -hmm. yes. And you know, too. Yes, I do. So we are prepared and we are equipped because we have been told what is going to happen. Now, the, there's, a, there's a third aspect of prophecy that is powerful. And that is that, that Yahweh includes with his prophecy teaching and guidance. And so when we're reading something that we have absolute proof is true, that absolutely unequivocally came from, from God and that God cares, and that it includes teaching, we're in a position to have our steps guided. We're in a position to learn something from the creator of the universe. And when we find that his teaching is consistent, his focus is consistent, the focus is on his covenant family, on his children. And that the guidance is, listen to what I have to say. Observe what I have written down for you. Come to know it, understand it, come to know me. Uh, and... And based upon what you have learned and come to understand, respond. That's it. That's it. Yep. Gosh, what an it. <laughs> what an it. Now, what it has enabled Yahweh you know, to do is to tell us the entire history of humankind. It enables us to understand the history of humankind. Mm -hmm. It also does something in the creation account that is extraordinarily powerful. It means that Yahweh could reveal his 6 plus 1 plan, which is profound. In the six days of creation, followed by a Shabbat, a seventh day, and have the timeline that he's presenting of six days of creation, followed by a seventh day of rest and reflection, be exactly equivalent to the 15 billion years it took from our perspective to create the universe. When you do the math based upon the radiation that is still detectable from the Big Bang, Yahweh's term, he used the term Big Bang, uh, 3,500 years before man coined it, that if you measure the cosmic microwave radiation, which we have many probes and devices, including the Wilkinson probe, to do, and you realize the stretching of the wavelength of, uh, of light, and you realize that it points to the time that quarks were confined. In other words, light energy could coalesce into matter. The time doesn't flow. 
You know, time simply exists until light is transformed into matter. So the point of the Big Bang, where light began to be, to coalesce and to be transformed into matter, the wavelength is stretched 10 to the 12th power, which means all you need to do is divide that 15 billion years by 10 to the 12th power, and 15 billion years are six 24-hour Earth days. There you go. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Amazing. And that's possible because of the relative nature of time and the nature of light. Mm -hmm. And what did Yahweh say on the fourth day that was going to happen as a result of, of what he created? We'd be able to see the light. The light would become visible to us as a sign. A sign for what? A sign that... Um... How about the word Moed? Moed, Mikraham. Yeah. I say, he said that the light, the ore, would become visible to us, which means uh, Yosha is a visible representation of Yahweh's light. So therefore, Yosha equals light. Therefore, Yosha equals Torah. Therefore, Yosha equals set-apart spirit. Uh, that, and that's why Yosha began in his first public address emphasizing and affirming that he was the representation of that light. But yeah, he said on the fourth day, which would be the, and he tells us that a day is like a thousand years. So the fourth millennia of human history, after being booted from the garden, that would be year 4,000 Yah, which just happens to be 33 CE on our pagan calendars, that the greater light would become visible as a sign for the meetings, the Moed. And he fulfilled the first four in that year.